How's it going everybody and welcome back to our Cisco Enterprise series. In this video, you and I are going to go over MPLS VPNs, a kind of a high level overview of how they work. Now, I actually recorded this video already with, you know, uh, notepad up and, you know, walking through all the terms and stuff like that. But I wasn't really happy with the way it came out. So it was, to, to me, it was too high level where it didn't really go into enough detail and stuff like that. So uh, just so everybody understands where we're at, uh, this will be our MPLS environment. And we are gonna go through and stand up MPLS VPN and get all of it working. And then we're gonna have 58, 59, 24, 23, 38, and 37 all peer to the MPLS environment, as well as um, the AS3 for internet routing so that we can bring internet connectivity in and we can take a look at how traffic engineering comes into play. So now um, one thing that I will mention during the recording process of this entire series, even though you guys will be getting into a, a playlist where, where everything is organized from like in order of kind of the blueprint, the way that the videos are, are being recorded are not in the order in which they are on the playlist. So I am bouncing around a lot when it comes to discussing things. So if something's working in one video that doesn't look like it's working in another video or you see routers turned on in one video and they're turned off in the next, there's a reason why. If you guys have any questions, always con you can always ask questions in the comment section. But the idea is so that I can demonstrate a lot of different technologies, different design scenarios and things like that. But I've been working my way through getting things operational as I go through stuff. So. I've covered a little bit of OSPF, a lot of EIGRP, just a little bit of BGP up to this point. So we're gonna be digging into MPLS because I really wanna walk you guys through and then start looking at more advanced scenarios and different capabilities and techniques that you can use and stuff like that. Like I said, this isn't gonna be your traditional like CCIE walkthrough. This is how technology A works, you know, steps one through 25 and boom, we're done. You know, it's gonna be kind of back and forth. I've already talked a little bit about how you can optimize EIGRP in a couple different scenarios, not just, you know, I've covered summarization a couple different ways, stuff like that. So what you and I are going to go do is walk through MPLS VPNs. Now, my goal here with this is to help you understand what MPLS is, how it works, what the different components of MPLS are, and how you would leverage it regardless if you're on the service provider side or if you're on the customer side and you're peering to an MPLS service provider through a BGP and things like that. So we're gonna talk a lot about those components to make sure that we understand what's happening because if you were to just read up on the, the configuration guides, the configuration guides or like a design guide for MPLS, it can be difficult to understand it unless you already have a solid grasp of how it all works so similar to DMBPN in the fact that it's an, uh, it provides an abstraction of sorts, it allows you to basically provide a shared network for a lot of customers. So when we use the term shared, it's no different than the internet, right? You have the ability of buying access to an MPLS VPN provider and then you know, you're going to be taking up a certain amount of their available bandwidth and so will 500 other customers and you can take advantage of some of their QoS capabilities through MPLS traffic engineering and certain uh, service level agreement or SLAs and things like that. The other thing we're going to be taking a look at uh, beyond just getting it stood up, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the order in which you can get stuff working, you know, how you get IGP working, then you get LDP working, then BGP, how the VRF comes into play, how you get the routing to work, route propagation, all of those things, you know, what the route distinguisher and route target are. These are all really important things to understand when it comes to the entire embodiment of MPLS. Because it's not like OSPF or EIGRP or even BGP where you just type in router the particular protocol and then you know, the autonomous system number or the process ID, and then boom, MPLS is working. MPLS is a conglomeration of technologies that are meant to provide a service. So at the end of the day, 
the service is going to be the VPN, the virtual private network. So what we're going to go do is understand what exactly each device is, how it works, what you need to have working, all that type of stuff. So I'm going to start at the, uh, we're going to start, let me go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit. We're going to start with what you need in terms of step-by-step -step process. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way and I'm going to bust out the pencil and we're going to start drawing here what you need in order for this whole thing to work out. So from the get-go, the first thing we're going to talk about is just, and for clarity's sake, this is the most basic MPLS VPN scenarios you can think of. There is nothing complicated about this at all when we, once it's all stood up. Now there are two pieces to MPLS VPNs, MPLS Layer 3 and Layer 2 VPNs. The first part is going to be the MPLS infrastructure, right? That's going to be a combination of your IGP plus LDP, Label Distribution Protocol. Uh, whoops. I wanted to make a better L. LDP. And then you have uh, some BGP in there as well for learning some information. <laughs> That's the MPLS infrastructure. The second is going to be your VPN deployment which is going to be leveraging your MPLS infrastructure, but taking advantage of the VRF as well as PE to CE routing. So if you were to stack them together in steps, this would be one, one, and one. This would be two and two. So when we talk about getting everything stood up and operational, we're gonna have an entire sec ses section, yeah, it's a, a few videos dedicated to the MPLS infrastructure, and then we're gonna have several videos dedicated to VPN deployment. Now there are a number of advancements that you can use and do when it comes to standing up MPLS VPNs. So there's the layer three VPN, which is the PE to CE routing component where you would peer via BGP, OSPF, EIGRP, ISIS, RIP, static routing. You can do all of those with MPLS. And then you have a layer two VPN where you can do a EPL, an Ethernet point to, uh, you know, point, -to -point connection, uh, e uh, Ethernet private line. Uh, you can do an ELAN, which is an Ethernet local area network where you're basically stretching layer two via this, uh, the SP's backbone, and we'll talk about how that comes into play as well. Actually, that's one of the things we're gonna be definitely doing as we get further along, is we are going to be configuring this connection right here, gig four, and gig three, or I'm sorry, ethernet three, on R64 and R65. We will eventually deploy a layer two VPN so that we can get N73 and N77 to be able to see each other as directly connected. Now, I don't know, I haven't tested this, so I don't know exactly if it's actually going to work the way that I expect it to, but the intention would be to get these guys to form a BGP peer in between each other, so we would be able to do VXLAN multi-site and get that all stood up. But that'll be coming down the road. So anything with Nexus where it comes VXLAN isn't a core competency, for what I want you guys to see, but when we get into, so um, Lisp plus VXLAN, I cannot write, equals SDA, Software Defined Access. So this is what you would work with if you're dealing with DNA Center or DNAC. So when we talk about things like this, this is where this is why I'm going to be demoing VXLAN, so you'll be able to see a real-world scenario with it. But instead of Lisp, for what we're going to be dealing with, it's actually going to be BGP, and we'll talk about why there's a difference between Lisp and, B, and BGP, and all that type of stuff. So there's actually several uh, theories that come into play with how all this stuff comes and uh, operates. Now, when we start talking about the the day-to-day -day stuff. 
The first thing that we, uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear off the screen. Whenever you're looking at MPLS VPN, I'm going to have two different, well, technically three different operating systems. We're going to have regular iOS, we're going to have XE, and then we're going to have XR. And we'll be able to do full demonstrations with all three of them and get everything operational. Now, once we've gotten everything covered and we understand what's going on, I will be taking a look at other capabilities like uh, MPLS traffic engineering just so you guys can see a couple of examples of what that might look like and how that would work and stuff like that but nothing crazy we're not going to go into CCIE service provider with that now when it comes down to how this whole process works like I mentioned when you're talking about MPLS infrastructure the first thing you got to keep in the back of your mind is you got to set up your IGP first then you have LDP and then you have BGP so let's talk about these three first because that's going to be really really important now one of the things that I'm going to be walking you guys through here is the terms for our terminologies the modern terminologies anyway Anything that connects to the customer is going to be referred to as a provider edge device. So these guys right here are going to be provider edge devices. Any device that connects to a provider edge or another provider device is going to be referred to as just a P, a provider device. So this will be a P, this will be a P, this will be a P, and these two over here are PEs. Now, what we'll end up doing from an IGP perspective is we will form IGP peerings, adjacencies through, in this case here we're going to be using IS to IS so you, can, you guys can see all four major routing protocols that are IGPs. We're going to deploy IS to IS. Now I will be doing a dedicated section for IS to IS and I'm going to cover it in this, uh, this topology. So we'll definitely talk about how IS to IS comes into play and where that, where that works. So now, normally you're not going to see IS to IS in an MP, inside of an enterprise environment. Where you might see it is if you have ACI, Cisco's ACI deployed, which is the application centric infrastructure, which uh, leverages the APIC, the application policy infrastructure controller, and Nexus 9K switches, where the APIC is uh, basically a Cisco UCS server. Well, ACI is used here, and IS to IS is the layer two connectivity between your spines and your lease switches. But we're not going to really be digging too much into that, but IS to IS would be used inside of the data center fabric if you were using automation. ACI automates the deployment, so just be aware of that. Now, when it comes down to this, we're going to use IS to IS. I will be probably using just a single level two design, so it's a backbone design to get everything reachable. I'll be demoing a bunch of different ways to do stuff, but I'm the at the end of the day, no matter how complicated you make ISIS, whether level two, level one, uh, whatever you want to do, at the end of the day, the loopbacks of all of the provider edge devices need to be reachable via IGP. That's the bottom line. Now You'll need to do for the route reflectors, which is going to be 32 and 47, their loopbacks will also need to be inside of IGP as well for reachability. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. LDP, Label Distribution Protocol, is, um, so actually before I go on there, all of these devices need to be IS, IS to JSON. So we'll have to do IS to IS here, here, on all of these links, IS to IS everywhere. And as long as you have that in play, you'll have full reachability. So IS to IS on all these interfaces that are inside of the MPLS VPN environment. Don't include the stuff over here. So anything that's connecting outside of this big uh, rectangle, pretend like it doesn't exist. Now LDP, the Label Distribution Protocol. So this is going to be your labeling mechanism. I'll just put in MEC for short. So the label is what gives MPLS VPNs their power. Now I'm not going to go into the details right now as to why labels are used right now. I'm just I want to make sure that you guys understand the the overarching pieces to 
the, the components that make up MPLS before we dig into the more of the, 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 the historical pieces. Now, LDP is a labeling mechanism, and LDP will leverage, work with IGP, in this case here, IS to IS, and when you are fully converged with your routing protocol, IS to IS in this case, you will then be able to exchange information with other routers via LDP, and you'll be able to form LDP adjacency. Now, LDP does discovery on UDP 646, so it discovers other LDP speakers, and then it forms a LDP peering or adjacency on TCP 646. So just remember TCP and UDP 646, and you'll uh, be good to go on most of your exams that cover MPLS. That's going to be the discovery, and this is your control plane. So when you go out there and do this, and you discover other LDP speakers and you form LDP adjacencies, just like IGP, your LDP uh, table and your neighbor table will should line up. Meaning, wherever you have an IG an IGP adjacency, you should also have an LDP adjacency. So wherever there's an I, also put an L for LDP. The labeling mechanism is exchanged. Now there is a about a million labels in the label distribution block of your LDB. In your LDB, you have about a million, it's a million fifty or so thousand labels that are available for you. And what will end up happening is, and I'll talk more about how this the label allocation process works, but that's essentially the, the, the block of space that you're going to be given when it comes to building out your LDP environment. So what will end up happening is once you have IGP working on all the interfaces and it's fully adjacent and you have L you've turned LDP on, LDP can be turned on at the interface level or at the uh, IGP level. We'll demonstrate both so you guys can see what that looks like. When you do it at the IGP level, wherever you have IGP turned on, you have LDP turned on. Simple as that. If you want to be specific with, with LDP, you can be do it at the interface level if you'd like to do so, if you want to be you have more granular control. But you can have just as much granular control if you do IGP and then specific passive interfaces. Now once you have these guys fully adjacent and everybody's happy, that's as far as you need to take it. Are there more whiz-bang wild capabilities for LDP? There are. Are we going to be talking about them? Not initially. We're just talking about how to get a super basic no uh, no fuss, no muss, as a guy that I used to work with used to say, no bells, no whistles, simply functionality. So once that's stood up, the next piece you have is BGP. Now we've talked about BGP, at this point in the video series, we've fully covered BGP up to this point, uh, in the, in the, at least in the playlist. If you're watching this um, in, the, in the playlist format, BGP from an IPv4, an IPv6, unicast routing perspective fully covered we've gone through all the you know the neat and taters of bgp so you should be very very familiar with how bgp operates so with b with this type of a design the full mesh requirement still exists so you would still need to do something in order for this to work so that means you either need to form a bunch of peerings with everybody or you need to go with the route reflected design the reality of it is, no one does a full mesh. Everybody does a route reflected design, so that is what we are going to go do. We are going to go route reflected, and our route reflectors are going to be 32 and 47. 32 and 47 are going to form BGP route reflected peerings with 64, 65, 46, 66, 96, and 97. They will become fully peered with the VPN V four and the six address family. So this is how the label allocation process works. This is a, so there's actually two different label allocation processes. Um, with LDP, you're doing the transport label. So how you get traffic from the ingress PE to the egress PE is how LD is what LDP is used for. VPN V4 and BGP is how the VPN label 
is, is uh, allocated. So that means whenever you learn a route from a customer device, so 138 advertises this subnet into BGP and 65 learns it on gig four. When that route is learned by the router, the BGP process is automatically going to allocate a label for it locally on 65 and then via BGP route reflection is going to update 47 and 32 with that information and they will pass it down to 64 and all the other provider edges so that they know what label if they have traffic coming in on 64 going to 101838 they know to send it to 65 so that's how that comes into play now we're going to set this up but that's no, we're going to talk about more about the the P, the the VPN process here in just a minute. But this is going to be your MPLS infrastructure build out. So IGP with whatever protocol you want to run, OSPF or IS to IS. I re either recommend OSPF or IS to IS. We will actually be demoing both, both OSPF and IS to IS. I will actually deploy, I'll start off with IS to IS so you guys can see what that looks like. So you get exposure to IS to IS. But then we will, once everything's up and running, we'll have a, well, this new CIO comes into play or this new fangled thing or whatever. We'll come up with a migration scenario. It may not make sense, but we're going to eventually flip over to OSPF and uh, get OSPF operational. And we'll talk about how you would do that. So we'll take a look at both. So just to recap the MPLS infrastructure piece, you're gonna need I, some sort of IGP. In our case, it's gonna be IS to IS, and we're gonna do a level two design in order when we actually, when we're done talking about all the different capabilities that IS to IS can support, and we go to make the IGP for the MPLS VPN work, we'll do just a straight level two across the board all in the same area. The next thing would be LDP, getting LDP fully adjacent, just like IGP. So your LDP topology and your IGP topology should be 100% in line. Then we'll do BGP with a route reflector design. We'll look at XR and iOS as our route reflectors, and we will be doing a route reflected design to all the PE routers. This shouldn't take very long at all. I can have this done in you know probably a half an hour if I was to like get after it, but I'm gonna explain how it all works behind the scenes as we start getting this up and running. So this will be one video when we go through there, even though I can knock out an entire MPLS VPN deployment in about an hour. It's, uh, this is what we're gonna walk through and do. Now for the VPN deploy, we're gonna need to talk about that guy now. And what the VPN deployment is, is it's going to be a cross between, between BGP and PE to CE routing. So the first thing we need to talk about is gonna be the VRF. The VRF is the virtual routing and forwarding table. And what VRF does is it's the virtualization of a router. So you guys are already familiar with a VLAN, which is equal to layer two. A VRF is equal to layer three. And what a VRF does is allows you to create user specific routing tables that you can then place particular interfaces inside of that will be outside of the global routing table. So you'll hear the GRIB, the global routing table, routing information base. You'll also hear the term of the default VRF. So when I hear, when I say global routing table, default VRF, they all mean the routing table that comes out of the gate on the box, whether that's a switch, a router, what have you. When we go to create a VRF, that is how we are looking to separate traffic out, and that's going to be customer specific. So anything that connects to the service provider from the outside, customer specific traffic, that is what a VRF is. And a VRF has two components. A VRF has the route distinguisher, or the art, it looks like, it doesn't look like, it looks like an A, the route distinguisher, and then the uh, then the route target. So we'll talk about both of those right now. The route distinguisher, what is its job to do? The, uh, both of these are 64-bit values and they're both BGP extended community values. So this is 64 bits, that's not a 69, that's a 64. 
64 bit. This is 64 bit. Now, the route distinguisher, what its job is to do is this value is prepended or put in front of any IP address that the cu customer owns to try to make the route unique per customer. So what you would normally do is you would do use a different route distinguisher per VRF. So if you have 10 VRFs, you're going to have 10 different route distinguishers. So there's a couple different ways that you can format this. They're all colon colon. Yeah, that's how you break it up. Each side of the colon is 32 bits. So you can do an, like a, you know, a one and then an IP address. You can do one and another one. You can do a two and a two. What it really comes down to is AS number, ASN number. You could give it just a one colon one. You give it a two colon two. Well, when we get on the CLI, I'll show you what the outputs are. So for uh, the sake of argument and ease of understanding, we are going to use one and then the autonomous system number, 10. That's what we're gonna do. This is gonna be our first service provider and the service provider's autonomous system number for BTP is 10. So one colon 10. What will end up happening then is you're gonna add another colon and then on the back half, this is a 32 bit section. So the entire uh, address now becomes a 96 bit address 64 bits for the route distinguisher, 32 bits for the address space. And what's going to end up happening is whatever subnets are advertised from the customer to the provider are going to be put in the 32 bit section. So your actual output is going to look like 1, 1 colon 10 colon, and if it's coming from uh, router 38 switch 18, it's going to be 10.18.38.0 slash 24. That's what it's going to look like. And what will end up happening is the reason the route distinguisher needs to be formatted a certain way per our route distinguisher is so that if customer, uh, you know, if, if you get 250 customers, you're gonna have two dip, 250 different route distinguishers because you it's a very real possibility that you have all 250 of your customers all leveraging the same address space. 10 net, 172, 192, 168. It doesn't really matter to me. I really don't care what it is. If it's an RFC 1918 address space, I'm throwing a route distinguisher in front of it. You, ha you have to define it, you can't not do it. So we'll use one colon 10, and then whatever subnet is advertised to us from the provider side, or I'm sorry, from the customer side, we are going to prepend one colon 10 in front of that to provide uniqueness. Now we could go out and demo more, and I've done this in other uh, videos. As a matter of fact, there's some videos I did where I did inter AS VPNs and I did three different customers just to demo three different MPLS environments and how that comes into play. So if you really want to deep dive into how MPLS VPNs work beyond what I'm covering, the, the basics for this series, because I, I was studying for the service provider exam at the, at the time. So they're probably five or six years old now, but they're still very, very relevant to what you guys will need to know. So what you'll be able to do is take advantage of that training if you want to know more about it. But for what we're doing here in a very basic deployment of MPLS, that's really all you're going to need to know. So that's basically how that works. Now the route target. The route target is, I, now I correlate that to an ACL, an access control list. And what an ACL or what the route target's job is to do is to control what routes you allow out of your VRF and what routes you allow into your VRF. And we'll talk a little bit more about how the VRF, uh, where you would use it and how you would use it in just a minute. But it's an ACL, so you have a, you have a route target policy. Actually, let me back this stuff out here. You have an import and you have an export. And the concept between the two is very, very simple. Import is what routes do you allow, do you uh, accept in from other provider edge routers? What does that look like? So you could get routes from 65 with 10, 18, 38, and that would be learning routes from another, another provider edge router. An export is taking routes that you've learned from the customer and then adding them into BGP. 
So regardless of how you want to look at it, you are going to either import routes from a BGP VPN v4 updates that come in from other provider other provider edge routers. You're going to import those into your local routing table, your VRF routing table through the import policy. And you also have an export policy of what routes you allow out of the VRF and into BGP. So import is in, export is out. Simple as that. Now this is also a 64-bit value and I'm going to use um, typically speaking, because we're looking for a very, very basic deployment, I'm also going to use um, 1 colon 10 for both import and export values. Now, what's going to end up happening is you're not going to put an IP address in front of, behind this. This isn't a pre-pending anything. This is just basically controlling what's allowed to come and go. There is another way of doing this that if you were to go look at my service writer um, playlist that I created a while back where I go into detail as to why I would use a different format. Another format for this would be like you have your VRF number which would be one and then you have a colon and then an IP address. So for example what let's pretend like it's 65 is uh, 10.0.0.65 and what you would do is every router would have a VRF configured on it. Each one would have a different route target value. So what you would need to do is if you had 65, 66, 97, 96, 46, you would have to take all those values and put them into a list on 64 to allow those specific route target values to be learned in, so to import it. So that's where the, the IP address comes in because it allows you to be more controlled on where you're going. So if we would do just this version right here, if we do this, we're saying any to any communication. I want to just accept whatever routes other provider edges are sending me. If you choose to do the one colon, and what this, that one can be any number really, and then you put in the IP, an IP address of a remote PE, so 10.0.0.65, this is like configure an access list to match on this specific IP address, and then you're only going to learn routes from specific remote PEs. This would be more like your hub and spoke design, where you want to really only learn routes from a specific hub. So that's basically where that co would come into play. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. It's just a little unorthodox. So. But I will. I demoed it in older videos, so if you want to see what that looks like, feel free to go jump into the service provider playlist and how that would come into play. But that's essentially what how that works. Now, the way that this gets operated is once you create your 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 VRF, and the command configuration for that is going to be VRF. On this is going to be iOS VRF definition. And then you give it a name. So for example, A, or whatever name you want to give it, right? And then you would create your route distinguisher, RD. In this case, there's going to be 1 colon 10. And then you create your route target. And then you would, uh, for iOS, you would type in both, for both import and export, and you'd say 1 colon 10. And this is completely valid. And then you would define the address family. Because when you're, when you're using the definition option, your saying, I want to be able to do both IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. So you just specify, you know, AFI, IPv4, AFI, IPv6, so on and so forth. Now, once you've done that and you have your VRF created, then what you need to do is go to every interface that there's going to be a peering on to the outside world. And all these interfaces need to get, be placed inside of the VRF. Now, what that's going to do is move these interfaces to a different routing table. So it's going to move it to the VRF A routing table. Because it's the name of your VRF. And when you move it to your VRF A routing table, what that will essentially do is it will take it out of the global default VRF, the global routing table, and provide you a customer specific routing table. And then what you'll have to do once you've done that is give it an IP address and all that other fun stuff. And then you need to go underneath global BGP, so in this case you're a BGP 10, and then underneath the VRF, so address family, 
Edris Family IPv4 A, you would then say that would do then you would do your BGB configuration downstream to whoever you're peering to. So you would do, you know, neighbor, you know, yada 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 remote AS two or whatever it is. And then once you do a BGB peering on both sides, then what you can do is start taking routes from like 59 can say, if we've got EIGRP running, you can say, okay, well, let's redistribute EIGRP into BGP and then we'll take BGP and we'll redistribute into EIGRP. So you're doing mutual redistribution on 59. So 46 will start to learn routes from 59 inside the VRF routing table because the routing uh, the route target uh, values are all the same on all the routers and the route distinguisher is defined any route that's learned from the customer will automatically get the route distinguisher of 1 colon 10 suit 46 will learn the routes and then propagate those routes to 96 64 65 66 and 97 via 47 and 32 because those are the route reflectors they'll get all those routes and then if they have any of their own PE to CE routing in place, then they'll be able to shove that down to 38 and whoever else is uh, operational, you got a BGB peering online and get that all working. So that is essentially how that whole process will work. Now I will be clear that we'll be taking a look at all the IGPs and static routing in terms of getting route propagation to work. So you can't static route to the provider and then do redistribution on um, on the PE routers into BGP through, you know, redistribute static, you know, whatever the static route is, all that good stuff. So all of that is, a, is an option as well. So in terms of that, that's basically what I wanted you guys to be able to, to take from this in terms of the day-to-day -day and stuff like that. So I will go into more detail in the next video of how this stuff works at the, the finite level. And then we'll go through and start doing all of our configuration and stuff like that as we go further along so it doesn't it's not terribly involved there will be you'll be surprised at how not complex this is and it was one of those things when I first started learning it I had a really really hard time grasping the concept um, because it was a new capability I was generally familiar with regular unicast routing which is destination based MPLs VPNs are destination-based VPNs as well, so they made it a little easier to follow along. But the reality of it is you've got an operational network that has multiple steps working. But if you do what I did and you put it into a flow chart, you go, okay, I need IGP, then I need LDP, then I need BGP, then I need VRF, then I need P to C routing, and then boom, problem solved. So it's very, very easy to follow along and I'm gonna be building it in that order so that it'll be easy for you guys to follow along with. And then once we have that entire topology or the MPLS VPN online and working, then we'll be able to take a look at some other designs and get everything, some other stuff working and focus on those details because there's gonna be a lot that goes into it. If I had to estimate how many videos, it's probably gonna be about 10, 12, and nothing crazy, maybe 15, but I don't think it's even gonna be that many. Because I'm not going to be going into super deep detail of how traffic engineering works and you know, stuff like that. So that'll be more of a down the road type of deal. But once we get a basic MPLS VPN deployment in play, then we'll be able to start looking at other capabilities as well and go from there. So there was a question, once I have all of the technologies covered, what is my goal? Well, my goal then would be to focus on specific scenarios. Like once I have everything up and running and everybody's happy, there's full connectivity everywhere and all that type of stuff. And I've done through, gone through basically the entire blueprint. You got to remember too, we haven't even touched multicast yet. We haven't touched any services other than basic um, FHRP with HSRP or VRP. So we still have a long ways to go in terms of other services. So we haven't covered NAT yet. So we haven't covered DECP yet. So we're definitely going to be having to spend time in those areas. But once everything's fully online and fully up and running and the infrastructure is in place, then you and I will just go through a variety of scenarios. You know, at that point in time, we'll be, maybe there's a question that comes up on a video. Somebody asks a question, I'm like, oh, well, let's, let's play that out. And so I'll record like a, an answer video, if you will, for it. 
So, but this is, my intention here is to keep things simple. There might be a lot going on, but if not, if, if at any point in time you're confused on something, don't hesitate to drop a comment and ask, and I'm, I'll be happy to answer questions. And there was another, somebody else asked, are you planning on using uh, Tech Support Thursday? And I do plan on using that still to answer questions, but I would probably do a Cisco Enterprise Series, you know, whatever question and then um, build it into the playlist so that it's like answering a question, you know, maybe I didn't explain something thoroughly or what have you, you know, I'll probably, I'll inject that into the playlist somewhere so that it's easier for you guys to find and you can like a Q&A sec session, something like that. So, but we'll figure those things out as we get further along. So I just want you guys to not worry about the, uh, the complexity of MPLS VPNs because there, there's a lot going on. And I haven't even talked about segment routing. I haven't talked about scalability with MPLS. We haven't talked about inter-AS MPLS. There's a lot left to cover. We're just scratching the basics here. It's very, very simple deployment. But the cool thing is, is once you learn how it works, it makes the service provider world that much easier to understand. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that is all I have for you in this video. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, feedback, Drop that sucker in the comment section below. If you haven't already done so, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch all of you awesome people in the next video.